So today we'll be going over shelter woods. Uh, I want to start off with sort of an introduction into uh, the theme for what shelter woods are going to be, and we'll do that as a little group exercise. And so again, we're still in the regeneration treatment unit. Uh, this is our final of the three even aged regeneration methods. And so we've already talked about clear cutting and seed tree. And a lot of this is going to be similar to seed tree. It just builds in more complexity because you often um, have maybe some more complex ecology with a shelter wood versus a seed tree. And you may also, also have more complex objectives. And so today we'll get into the economics operations uh, and the ecology of shelter woods. But again, just like seed tree, they help you out with a lot of those societal factors where aesthetically a seed tree doesn't have that visual of just a, a field of stumps. So. And so there, there we are in the context. Next class, we'll cover both two age systems at the same time. And so again, I've got shelterwood and seed tree highlighted there because there's some overlap between them. But you can see shelterwood are really going to favor more shade intolerant species. And so here's our definition of shelterwood. And you can see a lot of those pieces are similar to what we've already seen in clear cutting and with seed tree systems. Uh, so to get it right on a definition, you definitely need to include that it's an even aged regeneration method. Um, but then the real difference so far with seed tree and clear cut, what light environment have we been targeting? Yeah, so we've wanted full light, and I think they phrased it as a fully exposed micro environment. Um, and so we want full light. Shelter wood is different, and that's why the word shelter is right there in the name. You're using some wood, some trees that you've left after a first harvest to moderate the micro environment. And you're doing that because that shade will help minimize or reduce the establishment of very intolerant species, of your pioneer species, and favor other species that may be more intermediate in shade tolerance, uh, that may generally be later successional species that you're targeting for management. And so that moderated microenvironment is provided by residual trees. And so the other thing where this gets a little more complex than seed tree, most seed trees, we have two cuts. Go in and harvest all but a few seed trees per acre. Then you come in after that and you remove those seed trees in three to five years for southern cut. But here we have three types of cutting out. So we've added a type of cut. And the first one is the one that we've added, that optional prep cut is gonna be a difference from the seed tree approach, uh, where you're trying to enhance conditions for seed production. And we'll get more into that later today. And then you have the establishment cut and the removal cut. Those are very analogous to the two cuts that we've already seen in the, the seed tree system. The difference is that in that establishment cut, you leave a lot more trees per acre because you're trying to produce shade. So that's that moderated microenvironment. And the removal cut, you take them off. So, so that's what a shelter wood is. And so let's kind of start with a sort of group exercise where we look at a couple images of the stand. Uh, these were taken over in Sherburne Wildlife Management Area, just west of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. <clears throat> this was an area they were managing for a diversity of wildlife species. So they didn't have one species in mind, they just wanted diversity of forest structure of composition with their forest species. And the, the thought is that would lead to a diversity in wildlife species. Um, and so these two areas were pretty close together within this stand. Um, and so your management objective is just building in structural diversity, age class structure diversity. So you're looking for diversity. Um, on that photo on the right, that is a road down the middle. So kind of ignore that road and look at the edges of that photo. Uh, but that's the sort of uh, stand conditions you saw in that one area. And then it was probably 100 or 200 feet away uh, where that photo on the left was taken. And so you can see some very different conditions, but we're treating all of this as one stand. Okay. Um, so what I want you to do is uh, go ahead and split up into your groups. Think about deploying a shelter wood and come up with marking guidelines. So how are you going to mark the stand? Um, and see if you need different guidelines between the photo on the right, that area of the stand, and the photo on the left. So try and produce some marking guidelines to implement the shelter. Okay? Should the same trees? Yeah, so how would, you, how would you paint the trees that you're either going to cut or you're going to leave? You can paint either cut trees or leave trees. Uh, 
depending on the situation. So, you know, come up with some marketing guidelines. Are you going to paint, you know, half of them? Are you going to paint none? What are you going to do in these different areas? So what trees need to be removed? What trees need to be retained to manage this stand using a shelter wood based approach? Any other questions? Okay, take a few minutes work on that. I'll be walking around to help you out with that. Okay, so it sounds like most of you have some pretty good ideas on what you'd be doing here. So let's let's take a look at these two different areas. Okay, so can you do the same thing in both of these areas? No, you, you see very different forest structure out there. Um, so on the right, that structure where you have what appears to be a high density of smaller trees, uh, what do you need to harvest there? So you could harvest some of the smaller trees. Are they gonna be merchantable yet? No, they're not gonna be merchantable yet. So anything you did there would have to be pre-commercial. And then, you know, this is Louisiana. Do they have many pines in Louisiana? And Baton Rouge is right on the Mississippi River. So you're in the Mississippi River floodplain. If you look at the range map for Lava Lake Pine, there's a gap there, right, for the Mississippi River floodplain. So this is not a pine ecosystem at all. This is a lot of different hardwood species. Um, and so in hardwoods, are, are we generally thinking about pre-commercially thinning them? So often with hardwoods, we don't, okay? Because even when you're managing for wildlife, if your management for wildlife can be consistent with management for timber, that timber can be sold and help you pay for a lot more wildlife management treatments. And so wherever possible, where your, your landowner objectives are consistent with timber, you want to help improve that timber quality because that'll help fuel your other objectives. And so we often need hardwoods to go through a protracted period of stem exclusion because if we don't, think about an open grown oak. We've all seen open grown post oaks around here. Um, they're big, they're wide, they have branching crowns. They don't have one main stem. And so you need that protracted period of stem exclusion where you have trees at a high density so that they will maintain one main stem, they won't fork, and you'll have that saw timber potential in the future if that's consistent with your other objectives. If you have a wildlife species where you need a forking wide crown, then that may not be consistent with your objective. The other thing that I'll help you do is self prune um, because many of our hardwood species may be more tolerant of shade than what we're used to in pine. And so that changes the self pruning. They don't self prune as much. And so this will help them self prune, uh, which reduces knots in your butt log, which is your most valuable log there at the base of the tree. So what might you do in that area with the photo on the right? So what was that? You could mulch it. So what are you trying to do? So you're trying to clear it out and open it up is the idea. Um, so a mulcher would certainly accomplish that. The, the downside to a mulcher is it, it is expensive. So often we don't think about mulching stands that are much larger than 15 or 20 acres just because you may be looking at $500 an acre or more. It's an expensive treatment. Um, so here's the other question. On the right there, we can see we have a lot of stems uh, they're smaller, and so as we're managing that, what, what phase of stand development is that in? So we're in stem exclusion, and is that going to be earlier in the rotation, later in the rotation? Earlier, so early in the rotation, what sort of treatments are you often thinking about? You might herbicide, so if we had something in there, if we had Chinese tallow, chinaberry, other species, that we wanted to remove, we could hack and squirt with herbicides. But say the composition's about what you want, what sort of treatments are you thinking? You don't need to manage it right now, okay? And so the, the appropriate response in that photo on the right may be just stay out of there with any sort of equipment, let it grow on that area on the right. Um, it's still early in the rotation for that area, and so the appropriate thing is just give it more time, okay? Now, if we look at the area on the left, we see a very different stand structure, right? We have much fewer stems per acre. Uh, they're clearly much larger trees. And so what, what sort of regeneration do you see there? Do you see a lot of advanced regeneration of our, our different tree species there? What's in the understory? <laughs> 
We have a lot of ferns, right? And so there, if, if that just happened to be clear cut now, you know, would you anticipate um, a lot of good trees coming back? Maybe, maybe, maybe not, okay? So that's an area where your regeneration potential is currently poor. Are some of those trees large enough to be mature, uh, ready to be harvested? Some of them probably are. And so there's different types of maturity. Trees can be biologically mature where they're gonna start to senesce and you know, fall apart later uh, in life. Trees can be economically mature where if we leave them longer, they, you know, they've already hit their peak value. They're not gonna gain value at a very quick rate. Uh, they can be mature from an insect or disease standpoint um, where past that they're much more susceptible to different insects uh, or diseases. So lots of different concepts of maturity are out there. Uh, but, you know, that's an area where if we're using a shelter wood, if we're managing for diversity, you've got the opportunity to start getting a younger cohort established there. And so if you wanted to get a younger cohort established in that photo on the left, what might you do in terms of marking trees to be cut? What sort of treatment are you thinking about applying there maybe? So if you wanna get new trees established there, a new cohort, what do you need to do? So you could plant, um, but out in this WMA, they, they weren't actually doing a whole lot of planting. So say if you wanted to focus on natural regeneration there in that photo on the left, what can you do to help a new cohort begin to establish there? So you might need some sort of control on the ferns. That, that's a very wet site. It's probably not a site where fire is, is gonna be, would have been much of a natural disturbance there commonly. It's not a site where you're gonna easily carry fire during most of the year. Uh, you'd need some pretty exceptional circumstances. And your overstory trees may not be very pyrophytic. So that might be an area where if you put in a burn, you have a lot of species where you could be damaging uh, the trees just because they're not well suited to fire. So herbicide might help you deal with the ferns there. Uh, again, if we're talking about a wetland here, though, you have to be careful. You have to make sure that you're using herbicides as they're labeled so they could be applied in those conditions. Yeah, Kelly. Right, so you may want some shorter understory trees for wildlife, so you've got cover, so you've got browse, all those things, but you don't have them there, right? So what could you do to get them? So you could cut some of the bigger ones down. So in the context of a shelter wood, what could you do there on the photo on the left? So think about the process of a shelter wood. So which of our cuts? We had the prep cut, we had the establishment cut, we had the removal cut. So what do you think? Yeah, so that, that's an example of an area that it would be appropriate to start implementing an establishment cut. So if you look at removing approximately half of that overstory there, you've still left half the trees in the overstory, so you're still gonna get a lot of seed well distributed throughout the stand, even if those are heavy seeded species like oaks and hickories. And then you're gonna get some partial shade and that partial shade will favor trees like oaks and hickories. And that partial shade will help prevent the establishment of trees like sweet gum, um, cottonwood and other species that may be more intolerant of shade, sycamore. And so it's gonna favor maybe some of those heavy mass producers you're interested in. And so in the area on the left, you could get the establishment cut going, try to build up that pool of advanced regeneration and then think about removing it later. Um, and so you can see already, this is, this is kind of complicated, right? And I didn't pick the simplest and most straightforward example here to start with. And so that, that was, those photos were taken in 2015 out on the silviculture instructors tour. And out in this stand, it took like 40 silviculture professors about a 10 minute discussion to figure out what the heck to even call what they were doing out on this site. And we finally came to the conclusion what they were doing was kind of a group shelter wood. Um, so in this particular area, uh, they get hit by hurricanes and other high wind events. And so what they figured out is about every 20 years or so, uh, on average, they're gonna get hit by a pretty severe wind event. And so sometimes that wind event will act very much like the establishment cut. So they may walk into an area and look around and say, hey, we've already got a lot of good regeneration here. 
why on earth would we do an establishment cut when, you know, the storm basically just did it for us? But they would walk into other areas because all these disturbances are pretty patchy. They would walk into other areas. They would have looked like that photo on the left and they would have said, this stands at maturity. We need to start regenerating it. So let's think about doing an establishment cut in a shelter way. And so as you walk through your forest, it's not homogenous. It's not where all the trees are mature and you can just do that shelter with establishment cut everywhere and treat that whole stand as being completely homogenous. Rather, it looks like this image here where you might have areas where you can see those gaps on that top photo and those gaps are allowing regeneration there. Those gaps may not need much management. You can just allow that new cohort to establish and you're in good shape there. So within those gaps, it may be that photo on the right where you had the dense um, cohort, you know, with all those small trees in it. But other areas you can see need help. So you may try to expand those gaps by doing establishment cuts near their edges to help expand them and get more regeneration outside the gap, allow even more light into the middle of the gap, and just through a series of harvests. And again, they may be going back in in this WMA every 15 or 20 years and harvesting trees in some areas and eventually gradually over time, over a longer period, you may end up cutting uh, more or less your whole area, but then you have some areas that are older again um, because they established earlier. And so this is what that might look like if you're looking down on it, um, where you have these different areas and different stages where there, that area labeled number one, that's the intact mature overstory, the older cohort, um, and it may need an establishment cut. The area number two, you can see you've got a lower density, so that's an area where establishment cut has already been performed. And then the area labeled three is where you may have just done a removal cut in this group shelter wood, okay? But look at that diagram from a wildlife perspective. If you've got a wildlife species that needs dense cover, it's there for it. If you've got a wildlife species that needs, you know, browse or forage down near the ground level, it's probably there for them. If you've got a wildlife species that needs large trees that are, have an open mid-story and understory, it's probably there somewhere for them. Um, if you've got wildlife species that just need big trees, they've got it. And so you've got a little bit of everything out there. And so again, that builds in that idea of diversity. When you look at this diagram, we're talking about shelterwood being an even age silvicultural system. Is that an even age stand? This is definitely not an even age stand. Um, so that's gonna be two aged at a minimum and you could very easily see these as uneven age stands. And so that kind of gets tricky, right? Where we're learning even age for generation methods, but then we're talking about using them to manage uneven age complex forests. And so with that group shelter wood, it gets at this idea of you have the forest, you know the disturbance regime, you know the species that are out there, you know what structures you want, and so you start getting into the art of silviculture. And so with this approach that they were using out in the Sherburne WMA, they had about seven foresters that were working there. And what they would do is just train up the new foresters as they came in, and they would walk through to mark this stand and they would have their paint gun to mark it, but they knew what they wanted was the diversity of structures and they wanted the diversity of species. And so in open areas that didn't have good regeneration, they would look at putting in an establishment cut, removing about half the overstory. Now, as they're doing this, what they're trying to do is harvest the more abundant species and retain the less abundant species. So if they walked into an area and there was one sugarberry and 50 water oaks, they would leave the sugarberry and cut a lot of the water oaks. But if they walked into another area where there were two water oaks and it was just a whole bunch of sugarberry, they would cut a lot of the sugarberry and leave those water oaks. So they're just looking around the local area, figuring out what's most abundant, and that's what they're trying to do most of the removals from. So you keep maintaining that diversity and you don't push it all towards just the single dominant species out there. And you may have different timber value between those removals, but remember, timber is not the number one objective. So if you're leaving some higher value stuff to remove some lower value stuff, but it's meeting their objective, that's what they're gonna do. Then they would walk through areas like the photo you saw on the right with the dense regeneration. They would say, hey, the hurricane already did this for us. We're good, we don't need to do anything here. Let's just walk away and not worry about that. And so they're able to train the new foresters on this marking guide. And you can see it's really getting pretty heavily into the art of silviculture where it's just based on the foresters understanding of the ecology and the objective here 
um, and they're, they're kind of working through it on the fly as they go, but it's been working for them. They're, they're getting a lot of diversity of species and structure out there, so it's going to be meeting all those wildlife habitat objectives. And so this is the thing you really have to keep in mind as we talk about shelter woods. When you start talking about shelter woods, ask a lot of questions, okay? Because I could tell you that we're doing a shelter wood out on this property. And after you see all this diversity here, we're gonna go through today. You don't know if I'm talking about an even aged forest, a two aged forest, an uneven aged forest. You don't know my objectives. So if all I tell you is I'm doing a shelter wood, it's really easy. All of us in our mind, we're probably gonna think about the uniform shelter wood. We take the whole stand, we cut half the overstory out. We get a regenerating cohort. We remove the, the overwood that half the overstory we left and we have an even aged stand. That's the simplest application of the shelter wood. But shelter wood is extremely variable and people have done a lot of different things with the shelter wood. And so this sort of gets at the idea of what we're doing on prescriptions all semester. Um, shelter wood really just exemplifies this where it's complicated, it's confusing. So always keep in mind, what are your objectives? What are the conditions out on your stand? And how do you get from the stand structures you have now to a stand that's gonna meet those objectives, okay? Um, so, you know, th this is true on every prescription we're doing this semester, but it's especially true to keep in mind when we talk about shelter woods. It's a variable system. So here's that simple application of the shelter wood, right? That uniform shelter wood where we only have two cuts. That's another thing that shelter wood can vary in. It can vary in the number of harvests you do to implement it. We just saw that group shelter wood that may be almost like a group selection system almost, where you're coming in every 15 or 20 years, almost on a cutting cycle. Whereas this approach here, it's gonna be an even age stand, just like a seed tree was an even age stand. So in this uniform shelter wood, you do the establishment cut, there's no prep cut, they didn't need it, so they didn't do it. And then you got new establishment there, you remove the overwood uh, in that removal cut, and then for the overwhelming majority of your rotation, that may have taken five to 10 years between the establishment cut and the removal cut. So for five to 10 years, you had two cohorts out there. But if you're on an 80 year rotation, for the vast majority of your rotation, you've got an even age stand out there. So this is why we think of the shelter wood as an even age system, because a uniform shelter wood can produce an even age stand. So as we start looking at examples of shelter woods, there's a lot of different things that you can manipulate within a shelter wood. You can manipulate the amount of overwood you leave after the establishment cut. You can manipulate how long you leave that overwood on. And then depending on where you are, so this idea of you walk out and there's no seedlings, there's no saplings, you remove half the overstory and you're gonna get seedlings and saplings that you can then grow as the next cohort, that doesn't even work everywhere. If you go east of the Mississippi and try to manage many bottomland hardwood cover types, you don't even think about doing that shelterwood establishment cut unless you already have a good pool of advanced regeneration in the understory. Because if you try to get them just from seed after the establishment cut, you know, we've got just such aggressive competitors, sweet gum will regenerate in partial shade. You'll end up getting species that may not meet your management objectives. So in some areas east of the Mississippi, they don't even think about doing that establishment cut until they walk out there, they do a regeneration survey. We're gonna do that later in lab this semester, so you'll get to see how that works. And you look at the results of your regeneration survey and say, yeah, we've got a lot of potential here to develop a strong new cohort of desirable species. And so here's an example from the Ozarks with upland oaks. And you can see the site index at 50 years is only 80 feet tall. So if you start getting into more mountainous parts of the country, often we talk about hardwood systems on these ridges and the, the site indices are pretty low in some areas of the topography. And so you can see we've got pretty dense shade in the understory there. And so that, that's a stand where you could look at putting in a shelter wood um, to open up that light a little bit more and get some of that regeneration going in there. Um, so Dr. Kidd's hardwood silviculture class goes over, you know, a lot of areas like this in up in Arkansas, Oklahoma, um, and how they've been managing those on some of our national forests. So here's an elm sugarberry cottonwood sycamore cover type. So this is going to be uh, what we're seeing often along some of our, our major river bottoms. 
Um, and so you can see in this area, you've got a, you know, a few small trees, you've got a few large trees in the background there. Um, and you know, we'll get into this more next class where maybe you're trying to manage a two age stand with that blend of small and large trees. And you can start thinking about deferring the harvest uh, on some of that over wood. So again, another way you can manipulate a shelter wood. Um, this is, you know, that pretty straightforward application in Mississippi of a shelter wood. Where, what have they done out here? Where in the process are we of a shelter wood here? So if they just did the removal, we should be left with a, you know, a bunch of small trees, right? Um, after the removal cut, you should have an even age stand in a uniform shelter wood where it's just the young trees you've regenerated. So where are we in the process here? They've just completed the establishment cut. You can see it was relatively recently based on the amount of slash that's out there. And you can also see, it's hard to tell because it's winter, right? And so they may have a high density of oak seedlings and saplings out there, and we're just having a hard time seeing them because they're leaf off right now. You would hope there are. Um, but if not, they're, they're hoping that they'll be able to regenerate from that retained overwood uh, by seed. Um, here's an example in upland hardwoods in West Virginia. And so they've left 20 to 30 square feet per acre of basal area. And you can see this is the same phase. They've completed the establishment cut and they're going to leave that over wood until they get uh, more regeneration. With this photo and the last photo, see how you've got a lot of light in the understory? Why is that? It's winter. These are deciduous species, okay? And so you are going to have a lot of light in the understory until they leaf back out. And so these photos will look very different taken in the middle of the growing season. That's where you would see that more moderated light environment. Um, here's Scott's pine up in New York, so not even a native species, and they've again left 20 to 30 square feet per acre. Uh, so you can make this work in conifers, um, if you've got conifers that are more tolerant of shade. And again, we're used here in the south, most of our conifers are southern yellow pines, they're all intolerant of shade, but there are conifers out west and in other parts of the country uh, where they do have conifers that are more shade tolerant. Coastal redwood out in California, western red cedar, other species. Yeah, Katie. Um, but it's like, is it really just like, you can do a shelter wood with loblolly. We do know it's intolerant of shade, but shade tolerance will actually vary depending on tree size and age. Um, and so many of our southern yellow pines, maybe not long leaf, uh, but loblolly slash and short leaf, you can grow them up to about DBH height. Um, and up to that point, they'll be relatively tolerant of shade. But if you continue to leave them in a shaded environment, uh, they become increasingly intolerant and they don't tend to make it for long. Um, so you may be able to get a species like Lavalier to regenerate with a shelter wood. Um, if you're going to do that, you know, a seed tree, if you're managing for timber and you're choosing between a seed tree and a shelter wood, a seed tree makes a lot more sense. But again, if you have that mix of objectives where you have a landowner and they're like, yeah, I want some timber off this property, but I, I really, I always want a lot of trees there. I always want to see a lot of trees. You may start thinking about moving more towards a shelter wood. So they have that sort of park-like look at first before the new cohort gets this tall and dense and it's just real thick. Um, but then you could even, you know, depending on how much overwood you've left, you could remove the overwood in one or two harvests. So it sort of staggers it and they continue with those large trees. And we'll talk about this a lot next class. Anytime you have an intolerant species and you've left big mature trees and smaller trees, think about the two age stand we were out on the very first lap. You are going to suppress the growth of that younger cohort. And so there, there is a definite trade off there where if you're trying to max out timber value, a clear cut or a seed tree would be more favorable. But if you've got this blend of objectives, it can make sense. Yeah. Here's Eastern white pine. You can see they've left 80 to 100 square feet per acre there. Um, and so that, that's a stand that would need to be opened up a little bit more uh, to get some good regeneration going. Here's ponderosa pine out in Colorado. So you can see they've left 20 residual trees per acre. Um, so ponderosa pine in Colorado, what's probably our most limiting resource? Water, right? So we're very used to systems around here where there's plenty of water, there's often plenty of soil nutrients, 
And so what's limiting our growth around here is them competing for light, okay? So they're really competing intensely for light. Their light's not gonna be the most limiting resource. Water's more limiting. So that kind of changes how you have to start thinking about a shelter wood where it's not so much them competing ab above ground, but it is the trees competing below ground. And that may dictate how much over wood you leave, how you space them out, um, where, you know, the, the moderated micro environment there it's not so much a competition effect like we think of in the east. Now it's that shaded microenvironment may be important so the seedlings don't desiccate. They get some shelter, they don't desiccate, um, and they have a better shot at survival uh, because of that moderated microenvironment. So you kind of have to flip your thinking when you move into a completely different ecosystem in a completely different climate. Here's an example of Douglas fir out west in Oregon. Um, and so we already talked about how they were doing seed trees and underplanting them out there. Uh, you could do a shelter wood where that may, may favor a little more uh, regeneration potential just because you have even more seed. And so a lot of these species, the Forest Service has tried out. These shelter woods, they've gotten them to work. They're just trade-offs in terms of the productivity of the, the next cohort. And so with our shelter wood, it's going to be a little bit different than a seed tree. Okay, we know the shade tolerance is gonna to be a little bit different, but we also know that for a heavy seeded species, a shelter wood is gonna be preferred over a seed tree, especially in areas where seed predation is high. And so that's gonna get enough seed out there per acre. But then another thing we haven't even talked about is what's the rooting habit of your species? So we looked at that Eastern white pine example, and Eastern white pine is generally a more shallowly rooted tree. And so with that shallower rooting habit, you may not want to leave a few of them per acre in a seed tree because those trees would be susceptible to wind throw and tipping up. So by leaving more of them per acre in a shelter wood, um, you're you know, preserving that older cohort so it'll be there uh, when you go back to harvest it. So it hasn't all just tipped up and fallen over. Um, and then, you know, you've got that sufficient basal area to, to prevent wind throw. And then the other thing that can drive your selection of how many of these trees to leave per acre may be just the economics. You may have the ecology out there where you want to do a seed tree, but you look at the economics and in your area, you just know there's no way you're going to get a logger to go back out there to harvest five trees an acre, 10 trees an acre. It's just not going to happen. And so you may need to leave enough trees per acre to get the logger to come back in for the second harvest to the point you look at it and you're like, well, this is a shelter wood now, okay? So that, that dividing line between a seed tree and a shelter wood, I mean, it, it's not just one line. It's kind of this fuzzy gray zone, right? And, and a lot of what divides them is really your intent. Are you trying to produce a shaded microenvironment? That's going to be a shelter wood. Are you trying to produce a fully exposed microenvironment? That's going to be a seed tree. Uh, but, you know, you can't look at it and say 15 trees per acre is a seed tree, 16 is a shelter wood. There's no hard dividing line like that. And so there's a lot of species well suited to a shelter wood. Um, and really oaks in the southern Appalachians, oaks in the bottomland hardwood region, especially east of Mississippi, but also here in East Texas, uh, oak dominated systems in the central hardwoods region. Southern Indiana, Northern Kentucky, those sort of areas. That's where you see a, a lot of promise of the shelter wood. This is honestly probably an underdeployed system. There's probably more opportunities to get good successful shelter woods out on the ground than we're currently using just because clear cutting is so operationally si uh, simple. But if we shifted more to shelter woods in some of these ecosystems, we would probably get better results in terms of the composition of our next cohort um, and, you know, it can help even with the form in some cases. Um, and then there are other species like southern pines, northern pines, where, yeah, it'll work. It, it may not be the perfect system for timber, but again, you have that mix of objectives and it can make a lot of sense. And then a number of different western conifer species. Okay, um, so let's talk a little bit about the different cuts and some things we need to think about around those different cuts. And so first off is the prep cut. And keep in mind, this is optional. So like everything we talk about in silviculture, this is a tool. If you don't have a problem, there's no reason to use the tool. So you're only gonna use this tool when it's solving a problem. 
And so we've got three specific things you often think about doing with a prep cut. You think about increasing seed production by basically allowing more light, water, and nutrients to get to the trees that you are going to leave as overwood for a period of time. So increasing your seed production potential. Um, along with that, you could think about starting to build up a pool of advanced regeneration like we talked about, where you'll need that in some species. You can remove undesirable seed sources. So if you had some tallow in a stand, you could cut that out early. Um, of course, you know, who knows how long seed will last in the seed bank. Uh, if you have seed floating in, if you're in a bottomland ecosystem that floods. Uh, but you can try to remove some undesirable seed sources. And then the other thing you can do is remove hazard trees to make subsequent logging operations safer. Okay, so those are the objectives where you would use a prep cut. Okay, so if you're gonna get a logger to go out in the woods to do this, ideally you want it to be a commercial operation because then it'll more than pay for itself, right? So let's think about a process of a whole rotation where we talk about all the different treatments you can use within a rotation. Is there another treatment we commonly do in silviculture that could meet any combination or all of these different objectives? When else during the rotation can you achieve those options? During a thin, right? So commonly in the middle of the rotation, we'll commercially thin stands. And when you're out commercially thinning a stand, you know, you can favor the growth of the trees you wanna leave as overwood, which is gonna increase their seed production potential. You can remove undesirable species, so you can handle the second bullet point there. And then as you see trees that may look like, you know, they won't be there by the next time you enter that stand, you can go ahead and remove them before they even become a hazard tree, potentially. Uh, and so you can meet all these objectives in a thin. So if you have a stand that has been well managed and it's been thin multiple times throughout the rotation, it's unlikely that you'll need a prep cut because many of these objectives may have been met already with those different things. If you can put together a prescription where you can be thinking about this and you know, you're already earlier in the middle of the rotation and you can get some things in that take care of this, then you don't need to do a prep cut um, which could be a pre-commercial operation where you're spending money doing this. So you wouldn't even need to do that. So where you're gonna need a prep cut, it's when you're at a mature stand that needs to be regenerated and that stand probably has not been managed well in the past, okay? So if your stand has been high graded in the past or neglected or you know not managed at all, those are the sort of stands where you start managing them um, and you may need to do a prep cut uh, in order to uh, set yourself up for success with a later shelter work. Okay, so hopefully, you know, you can get around doing a prep cut, don't have to do a prep cut. Then we talk about the establishment cut and both the establishment cut and the removal cut are gonna be pretty important in a shelter wood. With the establishment cut, the question is really, how many trees do you leave? With the removal cut, the question is really, when do you do it, okay? So there's different important questions for each of these harvests. So with the establishment cut, you know what you're trying to do. You're trying to establish the next cohort or you're trying to take trees that are already there and you're trying to get them into larger size classes. What's more likely to become a dominant tree in your next rotation? A seedling that's six inches tall or a sapling that's two inches DBH? That larger advanced regeneration is much more likely to become a dominant tree in your next rotation. And so what you may be doing is going out in an area where you have some advanced reproduction, but they're all one or two foot tall seedlings. And what you try to do with the establishment cut is grow those into sapling size classes, where when you do the removal cut, now those trees are much more likely to make it into a dom dominant canopy position in your next rotation. And we're gonna talk a lot more about that when we start our establishment unit and we start talking about natural regeneration. And so you want enough shade, but you don't want too much shade. And so some general guidelines, you know, you want between maybe 25 and 60 square feet per acre of residual basal area. In Southern Pines, you're looking at 30 to 40 square feet per acre. Um, in bottomland hardwoods around here, you may be looking at 50 to 60 square feet per acre for oak. Um, and so if you think about that, I keep telling you, you know, about half the overstory, about half the overstory. But when we think about bottomland hardwoods around here, our mature forests may have 100 to 120 square feet per acre of basal area. And if your target is 50 to 60 square feet of basal area after the establishment cut, that's gonna be about half. So that's why I keep saying about half. 
so those are some basal area guidelines. Uh, there are other guidelines that have been developed based more on the idea of the light environment. So the basal area sort of gets you as, as, to a simple surrogate where you could even estimate it with your thumb, right? Uh, and it's gonna be correlated to volume. So it's getting you an idea of volume. Uh, but the light environment may be a more important ecological variable. And so there, there are different objectives out there now where they may um, remove all trees, you know, in that stand in the establishment cut such that, you know, they're on average 60% of the total canopy height. So if your canopy is 100 feet tall, 60% of that is 60 feet. So you may want your trees spaced about every 60 feet. And so there, there are canopy height guidelines out there that you could use, and those are intended primarily to help manage the light environment to give you that correct light environment. But however you do it, you can see the, the important thing here is understanding the ecology and understanding the operations. You know, what's my final cut going to look like? Am I going to be able to do that? And then it's the same as the seed tree in terms of which trees you want to keep. Those trees are the parents of your next cohort, probably, so keep the good ones. So you could do this too light. If you don't remove enough trees, you leave too much shade on the understory, you don't develop the next cohort sufficiently. Um, you could do this uh, in a way that shifts composition favorably or unfavorably, so you need to think about what your seed sources are going to be. Um, and then you need to think about all the other factors we already talked about with the seed tree. Do you have a litter layer that's going to prevent, you know, germination of the seeds? Uh, do you have, you know, think about the stand we were out on last week at lab. Do you have that dense layer of vines? Like we saw a lot of grape vines, um, shrub layers like beautyberry. Do you have a lot of that out there that's going to impede regeneration? And do you need to use a prescribed burn or an herbicide treatment or some other treatment to help you mitigate those? So um, there's other factors you need to consider to get a shelter wood right. And then again, that question is, how much overwood do you leave? And we've pretty much gone through a lot of these factors now, um, thinking about operations, thinking about ecology. We talked about logging damage last class when we talked about seed trees, but you know, are, are you gonna be doing too much damage to your reproduction if you leave too much overwood out there? What, what's the balance of all that? So lots of considerations with the establishment cut. And here's your overall goal. You want that sweet spot in the middle where you've left the Goldilocks zone there, just the right amount of light, not too much, not too little. Okay, so on the final cut again, timing is key. And so, you know, in terms of when you remove it, remember many logging contracts are gonna be 18 month or longer contracts. So you may say the perfect time to remove this for my stand is August of this year, but you know, that may not happen, right? The logger may not get out there until the winter. The logger may get out there at different times, right? Um, and so for Southern Pines, we're thinking about the same three to five years we would think about with a seed tree. Um, for bottom line hardwoods in our region, you may be anywhere from five to 10 years, uh, but 10 years may be common. Central hardwood region, they're thinking about five years or longer. Southern Appalachians, they manage Northern Red Oak with this system a lot. And so with Northern Red Oak, you really just need pretty large saplings in order for this to be successful. So it's however long it takes you to get those pretty large saplings. You may want 15 foot tall saplings in order to get that to work well. Um, and again, you know, you want a lot of advanced regeneration at this point. You want a high density in that younger cohort because you know you're going to damage some of it. So, and if you leave it too long, you are going to start suppressing it. So you've got to get the overwood off in a timely fashion. Here's an example um, that'll show you the impact of removing that overwood in a timely fashion. Um, and so this is a longleaf pine stand. Uh, this is on some forest service property. Um, and so they have deployed a, a number of different treatments. And what we're comparing here with the different color shading on those bars, uh, the red shading on top is the older cohort. That's the overwood. The blue shading below is the new growth. That's the younger cohort. And so in an example where they did a shelter wood and then on that far left bar, they removed all the overwood, they've gotten pretty good growth out of the younger cohort. Um, so that's 1600 cubic foot per acre in that younger cohort, 30 years post harvest, that's a 30 year old longleaf stand. Um, the trees may be 40, right? Cause they may have left that overwood on there for 
three, five, 10 years. So the trees may be 35, 33, 40, somewhere in that range. And again, remember our conversion, we get about 100 cubic feet per acre, equaling about three tons per acre. Um, so if we do the math there, we've got about 48 tons per acre on that tall bar on the far left. So you're looking at a, a stand after a 30 something year period uh, where you could remove about a truckload and a half um, of wood per acre, pretty, getting pretty close to two truckloads of wood per acre. So again, this, this isn't a system they're trying to max out timber production on. Um, you know, we may be looking at four or five truckloads in an average pine plantation in the same time period. But, um, but then look what happens. If they leave only nine to 10 square feet per acre of overwood out there, so they didn't remove all of it, they left some of it, look at what happens to your stand. You end up with only three tons per acre about, or maybe six tons per acre, 100 to 200 cubic foot in that older cohort left out on your stand. So you have very little remaining in that older cohort, yet the, that small amount of volume, those few trees per acre, 9 to 10 square feet per acre of basal area. If you're using a 10 BAF prism, how many trees do you count in in a point to get to that? So imagine you're putting in a 10 BAF prism point. How many trees do you count to get to 10 square feet per acre of basal area? One. Okay, this is a plot where there's one tree in your plot. So imagine that stand. Okay, this is a stand that does not have much in the overstory. But those few trees in that older cohort are enough that they cut the productivity in that younger cohort down to almost a third of what it would be if they had been removed. And you can see that trend only exacerbates. You go a little bit more than that and you basically have no younger cohort, okay? To the point you look to the far right uh, and in those areas they left 45 to 67 square feet per acre of wood but if you'll notice, that's at about the same volume, that same 1,600 cubic feet, which is about 48 tons per acre, you got the same volume. So the question here, you know, if you do want some timber off these areas, do you want two rotations in a 60 year period and you're able to harvest, you know, a truckload and a half of wood per acre, two truckloads per acre every 30 years? Or do you want to manage on a 60 year rotation and you can remove the same timber volume at the end of that rotation. Um, so you're seeing major differences. And again, this is longleaf pine. This is a species that is very intolerant of shade. And so you would anticipate this effect to be lesser with species that are more tolerant of shade. But still, you leave the overwood on it, you know, 10 square feet per acre of basal area doesn't sound like it's gonna be a big problem, but it absolutely can be. So getting the overwood off in a timely fashion is gonna be pretty important. Um, and so again, with the shelter wood method, it's very, very flexible. So we've seen a little bit about the different cuts. And again, we're often thinking about that uniform shelter wood, um, but there's lots of other things you can do with it, whether you're managing an even age system or an uneven age system. Um, a big advantage here beyond aesthetics, beyond mass production is gonna be the, the rapid increment of high quality wood that you grow on that retained overwood. If you think about this, Cutting a stand down to 50 square feet per acre, that's a very heavy thin. And so in a very heavy thin in the overstory, you've left very few trees per acre. So the diameter growth rates of those trees is gonna go way up. And if these large older trees have already self pruned that butt log, you're gonna be getting a lot of wood produced on a valuable log with a valuable desirable species. Um, and so that can really help you out. So but let's look at a few different applications. We've got our uniform shelter wood group, a regular modified strip. So lots of different modifications around the shelter wood. And again, just keep in mind, it's just, what's your stand structure? What's your landowner objective? Which of these makes the most sense, okay? So we've seen the full three cut method with the uniform shelter wood where you do the prep cut because you have to, you do the establishment cut, you do the removal cut. The most common application of the shelter wood, the uniform shelter wood is probably our two cut system or you don't need a prep cut, so you just do your establishment cut and removal cut. But then occasionally you can even do a one cut method. So uh, what other silvicultural system have we talked about that would be really easy to confuse with a one cut shelter wood? A one cut shelter wood sounds like a clear cut, right? You go out there, you cut down all the trees, why on earth would that not be a clear cut? Um, you could call it a clear cut, that would be absolutely fine. 
But the idea here in the one cut shelter wood is that nature basically did the establishment cut for you. Um, and so in that one cut shelter wood, you don't have to do a prep cut. And in this case, you got a hurricane or something like that, that knocked down half your overstory. And so that was your establishment cut. Um, and because of that, you're able to get the good new regenerating cohort. And all you have to do is go in and re remove that overwood, the trees that weren't knocked down in the disturbance. So if you ever hear someone talk about a one cut shelter wood, that's what's going on. If you want to call it a clear cut, it, you wouldn't be wrong. Okay, so let's talk about an irregular shelter wood. And an irregular shelter wood is probably one of our most confusing regeneration methods. Um, because an irregular shelter wood, sometimes you hear it called a reserve shelter wood, um, it basically leaves that overstory for an extended period of the rotation. So it very easily could be a shelter wood with deferment. There's lots of different ways to describe this. So when you hear a regular shelter wood, just start asking a bunch of questions. When you hear a regular shelter wood, the one thing you know is that you have no idea exactly what they're doing. So you need to know what their objective is, you need to know what their harvest schedule is, and you need to know what the, the ecosystem structures are. And then you can start figuring out, oh, this is what they're trying to do, this is the forest they've got, this is why it all makes sense, okay? But if they just tell you, yeah, we're doing a regular shelter wood. If I tell you, yeah, we're clear cutting out here, you know exactly what I mean, okay? But if I tell you we're doing a regular shelter wood out here, I could be doing all sorts of different things. So you really don't know what I mean. And so you can actually make uneven age stands with these irregular shelter woods. Um, and so there was a pretty good paper a few years ago in the Journal of Forestry that sort of broke down three of the common things you can do with irregular shelter woods. Um, one option is um, there's a, a lot of what we call ecological forestry that people are promoting now. Um, ecological silviculture, of course, all silviculture, all forestry is based in ecology. So there's some controversy there, but what they're trying to do with this idea is do a little bit better of a job with our silviculture, mimicking natural disturbances a little bit more closely with how we manage our forests. Again, we've already talked a bunch about plantations, but remember plantations are not the majority of our land use. So the majority of the forests we are managing are not gonna be these simple forest ecosystems. They're gonna be much more complex ecosystems. So some parts of the country like the Northeastern United States their common mode of disturbance is gap phase dynamics. So in the Northeastern United States, 10% of the overstory blows down every decade. Um, so 1% a year, and that's often gonna be in high wind events and winter storms. Um, and so you can mimic that with silviculture. That group shelter wood we looked at kind of mimics that, right? Where a few trees blow down, then you get your next wind storm and you've got edges there so your gap can expand. You can mimic that. Another thing you can do with an irregular shelter wood, um, and I think there's an application for this right here in the southern U.S. that we may have overlooked and need to do some more research on. Uh, we've tried to get some funding on it, but haven't been successful yet. Uh, but continuous forest cover. So you can use an irregular shelter wood to create continuous forest cover. So what's an area that we have on almost all our stands here in the south where we need continuous forest cover? Exactly, Sally. Uh, so our SMZs, our streamside management zones, we know we want continuous forest cover. So the only requirements on our SMZs to meet forestry best management practices is they be 50 feet wide and have 50 square feet per acre of basal area here in Texas. And so how do you regenerate those? None of us really know. How do you manage SMZs? You either leave them alone or you thin them. That's all we're operationally doing. So no one's really thinking about how the heck do you actually regenerate our streamside management zones while always having trees out there because you need that to keep sediment out of the stream. And so I, I think there's an application for the irregular shelter wood that could work there, uh, but we really don't know much about it. We haven't done that research yet. And the other example of an irregular shelter wood, if you want vertical and hor horizontal heterogeneity, that fits the bill for that wildlife example we looked at on the Sherburn WMA. Vertical and horizontal heterogeneity is what you often look for in a stand being managed for diverse wildlife. And so, um, so this is the diagram from that publication. Uh, I'll post the slides so you can see this up close, uh, but it's probably hard to see up on the projector. But each one of those three columns is one of those three approaches. Um, and so on the left there, 
Yeah, so they've got the expanding gap idea on the left, they've got the continuous cover idea in the middle, um, and then our third option. All right, so our internet cut out in the classroom, so I'm going to record the last few slides here separately. I'll append the videos together. And so our third option here you see on the right is their option for an extended rotation. Um, so that could be a longer rotation where they're entering it at now, 30 years from now, and then again, 90 years from now. So you can see that's going to help build in some level of structural and vertical complexity that we've been discussing. So here's another example of the irregular shelter wood. Uh, this is the Swiss Femmelschlag. And so if you're on a longer rotation age, say you're on 40, 80 years, um, here an average of 60 years, what they'll do is they'll split up the harvests into multiple entries instead of just doing it in the two cuts. Um, and so this sort of gives us more harvests, allowing you to fell trees more frequently in areas on a longer rotation. Occasionally you'll hear the term modified shelter wood. And with a modified shelter wood, that's usually just a simple term people throw in there. When they're describing a uniform shelter wood, uh, where the thought is that the time between when you remove uh, the part of the overwood in the establishment cut and then you remove the remainder of it in the final cut, typically we think of that as being about five years. So if it's longer than that, sort of longer than that textbook time period, people call it a modified shelter wood sometimes. So think about bottomland hardwoods taking 10 years to remove the overwood. So if you hear that, it's just a simple little wrinkle on a uniform silvicultural or uniform shelter wood system. Occasionally you'll hear about strip shelter woods. I've never seen examples of this in the South, um, but if you had a boreal forest, for example, where you had a relatively large area that was relatively uniform in structure and composition, so think white spruce, um, you might end up applying a strip shelter wood. This is going to be similar in na nature to a strip clear cut. It's just you have the overwood there to provide a little shade for the youngest seedlings and to help you provide a little bit more seed. So here's an example looking at it overhead. So with each entry, you would go in and you would do an establishment cut in some areas, you would do a removal cut in other areas, and then you would have other areas next to those that were uncut or that were a little bit older and developing. Go back in at the next entry, you're doing all the same thing, you just shift each strip over one. And so here's another di diagram showing you what it may look like where our prevailing wind direction is from left to right and our felling direction is from right to left. So we always have good seed blowing um, into our area where we've created openings to get that regeneration. So again, you know, it's a solution, it's a tool, but if you have no use for a strip shelter wood, there's no need to worry about it too much. But one more option in our toolbox. So looking at the shelter wood in general, it's extremely flexible. Um, you can change the basal area you leave in the establishment cut to match the silvix of your species and your operational needs. Um, that overwood will be on there for a period of time. So if you get a few bad weather years, you get some regeneration failures, it can hedge your bets. Um, and it may take a period of a few years over which you get regeneration accumulating before the system is successful. But we've talked about this great aesthetics, great for wildlife, lots of benefits to a shelter wood. Here's just one final thought on the aesthetics. If you look at this picture, you see on the lower left there an open clear cut that you can see from a long way away on this ridge, very obvious. Right behind it is a shelter wood. That looks like a park. A few large trees per acre, people really like that. Or they'll look at that and they won't even be able to tell it's harvested at all. So in mountainous terrain, shelter woods have a major aesthetic benefit. There's some disadvantages. Uh, you've got more complexity there, so more entries logging. So there's always some risks uh, when you're out there logging of damaging standing timber. Um, it costs the logger some extra money to get out there with each entry. We'll get into this more when we talk about natural regeneration, but stump sprouting and germination of seed is always reduced under more shade in most cases. Um, so expect less stump sprouting. So that may hinder regeneration a little bit. For species like water oak, they're very prone to epicormic branching. So don't be surprised if you do an establishment cut, you get a lot of epicormic branches on the butt logs of the trees you've retained. That's going to be a degrade if they're too extreme uh, from a timber standpoint. Even though we know we want the overwood removed in say five years, you may get to that period where you're ready to remove the overwood operationally and economically within your prescription. 
and then you get three really wet years in a row and the loggers just can't get out on the site. So there's always things that can happen like that in the real world. And then last class with the seed tree, we talked about damage to regenerating trees um, during that removal cut. As long as you have adequate densities and trees of the right size, that, that helps in that regard. So that's it for our even age systems. So here's a table from the useful handouts packet comparing, comparing all the harvests in the clear cut, seed tree and shelterwood even aged silvicultural systems. And again, we've seen a lot of variation with shelterwood, but this is looking at a uniform shelterwood. So now hopefully you can look at that table and you have a lot more context around it um, and it can help you compare these three even aged silvicultural systems. So that is all I've got on shelterwoods.